Sabbath, good Sabbath, good Sabbath, dear brothers and sisters. All over the world, I send you the shalom, the sweet peace, the sweet rest, the delight of the Sabbath, the seventh day of the creation week that we commemorate each week at this time. Thank you for joining in and letting me share this time of Sabbath with you. I'm getting notifications, so I'm trying to deal with those notifications as we move forward. Thank you for letting me share this time to come into your homes, to come into your, your cars, your, your smartphone screens or, or your computer screens. Thank you for the time to be able to share these meditations from Parsha number 36, Behalotka. Uh, it means in your arising. It has a lot of prepositional phrases than, than the modifying phrases in it, but at the center of the name, at the center of the first major word of the Parsha, there is this verb, and this verb is called Allah. In Hebrew, Allah, you hear, ka, you hear that in there. In your arising, and you're getting up to do the stuff that you were called to do, to arise to perform a task, to arise to perform and, and maintain a, a protocol, to arise and be accomplish a goal. That is what we're talking about in your arising. And so if you should be no surprise to you that it's going to be time during this week as we as we live out, relive as it were the uh, very different uh, aspects of what Torah is. Each week, we as we go through the parsha, we of course relive what's going on in the parsha in our lives. We see it applying to different facets of what's happened in our interactions with human beings. In, our, uh, in our, our sense of what's going on around us in the world. We sense we're just reliving the story. So we're reliving Be'alotka this week. We're reliving a process of, of finalizing our preparations, uh, taking what we have learned and beginning to apply it. We're going to go from that sense of, of sitting and learning to the sense of actually putting into practice and putting into application that which we have been taught. Of course, where we have been taught, in the Torah lessons that we've been reading, in the sixth cycle that we're in, we have been at Sinai for 13 months. In our normal lives, we have been sitting and learning, perhaps in synagogue, perhaps in church, perhaps online through these messages or somebody else's messages, and there are so many now that we're not here whenever I started this process back in the 1990s, as far as the teaching goes. But we have been learning, we have been uh, accumulating information, we have been accumulating, hopefully, absorbing revelation and the energy that comes from, from divine revelation. We hopefully have done all that. But what we have not done is have to apply those things that we have learned in stressful, difficult situations. Not to the extent, at least, that we are about to be called to, be, to do so. Uh, I remember, you know, whenever my mother, bless her name, uh, her memory, that when she was in her last illnesses, she spent several weeks in the hospital after some operations and trying to recuperate from a very deadly disease. And in, as she began to uh, have a difficulty maintaining her strength, uh, she began to want to actually, I would call it binge watch. She would binge watch the the Food Network. And so I would sit with my mother, and my wife would, and we would sit with my mother, and she would be, as much as she could pay attention to anything, she would be watching the Food Channel. She learned about food she'd never cook. She learned about things, about how to prepare uh, dishes that she would never serve. But she, and we listened and learned with it, and sometimes we would almost feel inspired by a certain uh, recipe that was being given or the way of means of preparation, mode of preparation that we were getting. Well, in the process of doing that, uh, eventually we left the hospital, and here, here's the secret of mine. I didn't put a single one of those recipes to work. I've never cooked a single one of the recipes. I've never followed one of those cooking protocols. I learned it. It's in my head somewhere. It's up there in my consciousness, but as far as putting it actually into practice, I did not do so. Well, I hope that little story, that little introduction, illustration, has brought to you to the, the mindset of what's going on in Beha Alutka. Yes, we've learned a lot of things about the Holy One. 
We've learned a lot of things about ourselves. We've learned about things about our mission upon the earth, our calling, our covenant uh, relationship and beyond relationship covenant, uh, covenant purpose in this world. We've learned a lot about that, but we have not walked in the desert yet. We have not faced enemies. We have not dealt with our own flesh crying out, screaming out because of the deprivations and the sensory issues that we deal with and the emotions that are get raw by virtue of, of tiredness, exhaustion, hunger, appetite. We've not put these things into practice. At Sinai, that was about learning. This will be about doing. So we're going to go from belief to deed, to work. How will we make the transition? How will we fare at this transition? Uh, let me warn you, it isn't always going to be pretty for you any more than it was for B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. To the contrary, part of what we will see is that the Holy One knows that we're not ready, knows we're not uh, prepared to step into this treadmill rolling and just get right into pace with it. We're going to have some ups. We're going to have some downs. We're going to have, as we ascend, as we come up into this role, take our position and take our authority, we're going to have some major crashes and burns. And he's going to implement disciplines for us. Disciplines that are not designed to, to tell us how he hates us and he's so disappointed in us. Disciplines that he planned before the process took place because he knows what it's going to take to transition us from a mindset of believing and thinking and having ideas and having opinions to a lifestyle of being able to apply the truths of the kingdom realities, the, the message of hope and life and peace, and apply it in real life situations when the rest of the world is saying, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I just want to be angry. I just want to be offended. I just want to be stressed. I want to be worried because that's what scares me about this world. Well, that's where we are with Parsha. Come along with me. Let's go for a walk. Let's go for a journey through the pages of this Parsha. It begins with chapter 8, verse 1, and it will go through chapter 12, verse 16. Now, I'll kind of tell you a little bit about it. I call it this the Parsha of departure. As we've said, arising and then departing and stepping off, sandal meeting the sand into the desert into the journey that we have laid before us, the pilgrimage we're designed and called to take. So it's an ascension, a departure, and marching protocols. This is what the Parsha is, ascension, departure, and marching protocols. But the revelation download we're going to get, uh, and the narratives we're going to be, uh, be, be told. These are all about teaching us to uh, ascend from a state of stationary or uh, rest to a place of, of fervent, ardent activity, where we're actually engaging our world for positive, for purpose. Ascension, departure, and marching protocols. Do we know when to go, how to go, after whom to go, in what order to go, for what purpose to go, and with what focus to go? Ascension, departure, and marching protocols that will help us survive in the living wilderness. Well, Bahaloka means in your ascending or in your arising to fulfill a purpose for to, call, to, to engage a mission. So, as we have said this week, the cloud will move. The Parsha that we read, the, the four chapters that we engage, will have the process right in the middle of them. The cloud of the presence of the creator of the universe will move. And our great wilderness adventure, the tests of whether we will or will not, Shema, the voice and the words of the Holy One, our God, and follow his instructions and we'll let him be our king and our leader or whether we want to do it our own way this test will begin the great adventure of the wilderness will be on the testing will begin in earnest and it will be fairly intense we we will be launched out of our respective comfort zones this is not just something we read about in the torah though so it will be with all of us in our lives. Our families will be launched out of their comfort zones. Our finances will be launched out of their comfort zones. Our uh, flesh will be launched out of its comfort zone. Our pseudo intellect will be, will be launched out of its comfort zone. We will not be able to follow the same uh, standard behaviors. Church as usual, synagogue as usual, life as usual, economy as usual. That is not going to happen. We're going to have to do or die 
in the wilderness. We will be led. We will be guided. We will be given direction. We will be given instruction. We will have the presence with us. But we will be responsible for applying the things that we have known in real time. We're going to take up the arduous march that goes toward our destiny and our deployment. Our destiny and our deployment are awaiting us. They're calling to us. The real reason we're alive is not just to, to survive and do the rat race of life. It's not just to, to be a good person as we would hope to make ourselves or to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. The real purpose for which we are alive is destiny and deployment. We are sent as ambassadors of the creator of the universe to bring a message of life and health and peace. And so awake, come up, arise, awake, ascend. This is the Parsha of arising to ascend, but I will warn you. Warn, uh, <laughs> Ascent is not a linear process. It is not a straight up. We don't just go in one direction. I'm dealing with my notifications here in case you're wondering what I'm doing. Ascent is not a linear process. Here's the thing that gravity teaches you when you're a child. What goes up must come down. If we arise, if we ascend, there will be descents as well. There will be falls and stumbles. There will be things that happen. Ascent is not linear. What goes up must come down. But here's the good news I want to tell you before the descents begin, before the falls, before the failures, before the, the, the sense of, of collapse, crash, and burn take place and, and hit your spirit. Every descent we will experience is in preparation. In the kingdom of heaven, every descent, every failure, every fall is a preparation for an even greater ascent arising. We're going to keep growing even though it's not linear, the process is, is constant and, and, and guaranteed if we don't quit on the way. The Parsha is about lifting our heads. That's what we've been doing over the past two Parshas. Parsha Bamidbar, when we first began the book of Numbers, and then the book Parsha Naso last week. We're all about lifting our heads, getting a perspective so that we would be ready whenever he told us it was time. Well, it's time. And now is not the time just to lift our heads. Our heads should be uplifted. We should be seeing the things of the kingdom of heaven. We see the beauty of the majesty of our king and the calling and the need of the world. We should see these things. And now it's time to rise up, beloved. It's time to rise up. Not with opinions. And not with attitudes. Not with a sense of superiority. It's time to rise up and act as servants. And kindle the lamp with which we are called to enlighten the world. I want to remind you of a couple of verses from Isaiah. As we go into the summer months, in the, in the calendar of the kingdom, on the calendar of the kingdom, we begin to turn our focus away from the book of Ruth. In the early spring, we were on, focused on the book and the mindset and the spirit of the Song of Solomon. And then at beginning with Shavuot or Pentecost, we begin to turn our attention to the book of Ruth and the steadfastness of, of walking in the ways. And now, as we go toward the summer, we begin to turn our attention toward the book of Isaiah, the seven half Torah of consolation, the seven uh, prophetic messages that tell the great end game story of what the Holy One has planned and what our role is to be in that great end game plan. The Anarch Messiah doesn't win. The one world order does not prevail. Not on the long term. What happens is something else. And Isaiah 52, verse 7, first part of it says, How beautiful on the mountains are something. What? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those, uh, English KGV, I think it says, who bring good news or to, to, to plan good news. In Hebrew, it's mbisar. Mbisar. The flow who flow in joy and gladness and the good news of the joy and the gladness. How beautiful on the mountains are those, the feet of those Mabasar, who flow in joy and in gladness and who bring tales and stories of testimonies of goodness and gladness. And who Shema, who, who uh, I think it says proclaim in the King James Version, but the word is Shema, who Shema radiate Shalom, who just pulse and, and emit and, and re release Shalom everywhere they go. The shalom, what shalom? Shalom mi bisar tov. The shalom of good gladness, joy, peace. This is the thing we do. 
and to the third thing is and to Shema, Yeshua. And he, in KJV, it says, I think, something like uh, who proclaimed salvation. Well, the Hebrew word is Shema Yeshua. Who will Shema Yeshua? Well, this is the call. This is the message. Where we're trying to go with this and where the creator of the universe wants us to go with this is to be those people with the beautiful feet. The beautiful feet on the mountain. Uh, whenever the rest of the world is, is needing, suffering, collapsing under its own weight of its own flesh, its own pseudo-intellect, its own hate, then there will be people with beautiful feet who are proclaiming joy and gladness and peace and radiating that peace in real time in the real circumstances of the earth and who are in so doing radiating the presence the persona of Yeshua that brings forth the joy the hope the play and all the things that Yeshua represents and then there's Isaiah 61 the beginning of verses says the Holy One has anointed me the Bessar again this good news this joy this gladness this sense of, of rejoicing and have news and testimonies and stories that go along with that joy. The Holy One has anointed me, Lebesar the meek, or the poor, it says. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, draw to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound up, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Holy One and the day of the retribution of our God, to comfort all who mourn and console those who mourn in Zion by giving beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, and garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness or oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Holy One, that he may be glorified. This is your destiny. This is our deployment. This is why we are here. We're not here to deal with the world the way the rest of the world deals with it, to deal with the problems, to deal with the, the controversies, to deal with the flesh pots. We're not here to deal with it like that. We're here to become the ones who have beautiful feet, who radiate shalom and radiate Yeshua and Shema and radiate joy and good news and who bring it to the brokenhearted and the poor and the meek and the captive and the one who's in prison and those who are in, in mourning and, and brokenness. That is who we are. We are to give beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, and garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We are to be the trees of righteousness, the oaks of righteousness in this world. That does not mean we're judges. That does not mean we're critical. That does not mean we're, we think we're super spiritual. It means we have good news to tell because our God has done wonderful things for us. So Be'alot is all about three things. Ascending, the Allah verb that we mentioned, descending, which is the falls that we take place, the, the, the falling down, ascending, descending, and then getting back up, and then dusting ourselves off, and then finding a way to transcend. So ascending, descending, and transcending. That is the message. Don't let yourself get caught in a descent that you think is going to kill you or destroy you. Don't let it destroy you. Get back up, dust yourself off, and find a way to get through it and transcend and come forth singing the sound of good news with beautiful feet, with oil of anointing upon you, the Ruach HaKodesh. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring these good news. Well, let's sing our Baku and let's get started. How about? Okay. Baku Adonai Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Vayed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar Banu Miko Hamid Benatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai no ten ha Torah. Amen. Let's get started. Beginning last week, at the end of last week, in Parsha, not so at the very end, number 7, 8, 89, verse 89, we were told that when Moshe went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with the Holy One, he heard he heard the ultimate superlative voice speaking to him from above the, what we call in English the mercy seat 
that was on the Ark of the Testimony. And there and then this way, he conversed, he communed, he spoke, he buzzed, he got in tune with him from between the two cherubim. Well, that was last week at 7 verse 89, chapter 7 verse 89. Well, we're about to exit the beauty realm. Exit signs are flashing, and we're about to leave that realm of communion, conversation, intimate in, in invitations and, and responses in the beauty realm, in the tabernacle, and we're about to head out in another realm. No pressure, but all of creation just might be watching. And they might be watching and wondering if you're going to burn up on re-entry or if you're actually going to hold on to the beauty realm, hold on to its shalom, hold on to its majesty and its goodness and its joy and stick the landing when you come to earth. The first words of Parsha, Beha'olotka ar va'adaber Adonai el Moshe lemor. An English translation might be, and the Holy One spoke to Moshe, say, it's coming out of the tabernacle, out of the tent of meeting, out of the place between the wings of the cherubim. And the Holy One spoke to Moshe saying, and here's what he said. This should be in red in your Bibles. It should be in red in your spirits. It should be flowing, pulsing in and out of your mind. In English, it might read, speak to Aaron and say to him, in your rising ascending to take care of the lamps, el mup ne ha menorah, the light that is cast in the front of the menorah, ya iru shivat ha nerot, the shining, the glowing, the burning of the seven lamps. That's number six, one through two. I'm going to stop that reading right there. I want you to understand that Torah is uh, a beautiful book that teaches in multiple different ways. There is a way in which he just gives you an instruction, but that is not the main way the Holy One teaches. He teaches by speaking words that will touch your spirit and inspire you. And even if he uses a different name, in this case he uses the name Aharon, you know that he's really speaking to you. And you know that what he's speaking about is not something taking place in a physical structure somewhere. It is a transcendent reality, an emet, something that is eternal uh, and true, not just true in a, in a sense of being empirically correct. It is that which is eternal. We are always to be about what he says. Speak to Aaron and say to him, in your arising and ascending to tend to the lampstand, the lamps, and to prepare to shine your light. I will remind you that this whole Torah story began with the phrase, Yehi Or, let there be light. We have a part to play in every generation, in every situation, in every conversation with fulfilling the plan of the Holy One to let there be light. When you arise, when you ascend, to take care of the business of lighting the lamp. Well, we're going to have a series of things now. We're going to have basically three units of this portion that flow out of this or when you arise to take care of the lamps. The first is the first unit that we'll talk about is the final phase, the midbar proving ground preparations. This is preparation weeks. We have a few weeks. We're going to have basically five things that are going to be included in this final preparation before we depart. Then we're going to depart. There's going to be a narrative in chapter 10. Verses 11 through 26, we're going to have the actual narrative that tells us how we departed and what it was like. And we won't spend a lot of time on that because that's the center point. There's the hinge point. And then we have the third unit of Parsha, the Parsha Behalotka, which is when we actually, our sandals hit the sand and we actually begin to try to apply the things that we have learned at Sinai the lessons we heard on cooking channel in this process and see if we really are going to do what he told us he were going to do or we're just going to think about it and talk about it and consider ourselves super spiritual because we know it no this issue is are you going to do are you going to be 
who he called you to be or he's going to do what he called you to do. And then the unit three, the third unit, will have basically four geographical locations and things will happen and four levels of discipline will be applied to us to bring us back to the mission, give us a chance to come back into alignment with his will after we have fallen, after we have descended. The first of the geographical locations will be Tabera, the place of burning. The second will be Kivarot Hata'ava, the, the, the sepulchres, the graves of craving, where our, our appetites and our urges got the best of us, and we got quail. And then Moshe got it happened to him, and he got elders. <laughs> and they had about the same effect in the community. And then we the third geographical location is the place called Hatserot, and that place is where Aram, Aharon, and Miriam will join in the, in the negative speech in the Lashon Hara and the descent of the nation back into its pre-deliverance uh, pre, uh, mode of Egypt. And that, that will happen, and then we'll have the consequences of that at Hatsuro. Then we'll finally, the fourth location, we'll just be introduced to it. It will be the wilderness, the Bermidbar Paran, the place of pride and presumption pits. The place where we think we're really something, but we're proven that we're really not on our own, at least. Okay, so we're going to have to learn. Will we be uh, able to, to go through the di distractions of the desert, the disorientation, of the t spatially and in time, since uh, the, the lack of, of division between us? of disinformation that we receive, of dissatisfaction that we feel, we'll be able to overcome that. That's what real life is, is, is consists of. We have to deal with that and overcome those, transcend those things. And will we then be, by virtue of that and the disciplines of the Holy One, be able to uh, acquire, uh, cultivate, and flow in patient endurance, mission, task, focus, perseverance, because we have perspective, humility, and above all else, we love our king and we are sold out to his grand plan. We want to be those people with the, with the beautiful feet. We want those people carrying and passing out the oil of joy and the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Will we bring honor to the Holy One? who has invested time and energy and passion and has committed all the vast resources of heaven to accomplish amazing things for us and in us, will we bring honor to him? Or when we are confronted with the real challenges of the desert, harsh atmospheric conditions, hunger, thirst, exhaustion, neighbor negativity, <laughs> our neighbors get really negative, existential threats from enemies. When we face those things, enemies that are bigger and stronger than us, when we face those things, will we sizzle, fizzle, and pop? Will we throw a hissy fit? Will we react like traumatized souls? Will we revert to cowering slave mentality? Will we revert to sulking victim attitudes? That's the question. <clears throat> When things get tense, as they are about to, in our world as well as in our Torah studies, when things get tense and tough, will we follow the bridegroom king's lead and do things his way, the way he's been training us at Sinai to do, or will we sally forth in pseudo-intellectual folly? Will we do what seems right in our own eyes? Will we follow our own horribly deceptive hearts and the appetites and urges of our flesh? Will we follow the cesspool of flesh reaction and will we crash and burn in a great explosion of self-absorption? Question, will we walk in the spirit of holiness? His Kedusha energy, will we walk in shalom? Will we walk in joy? Will we walk in meekness and self-control and gentleness? Will we be his faithful witnesses of his goodness and his mercy and his power? Or Will we not? Will we rant and rage? Will we return insult for insult and evil for evil? Will we whine about injustices and intolerance from others while we blatantly engage in both of those activities ourselves? Will we co-labor with the Holy One, our God, to effectuate his grand plan 
for the redemption of mankind as a species and for the restoration of creation to its intended Edenic state of beauty, fruitfulness, and shalom? Or will we choose instead to slither around on our fleshly bellies, hissing at everyone we see, coiling it to strike anyone who gets close to us, and spewing tree of knowledge sourced poisons at every person, place, and situation we encounter? What will be our path? Is what we have received at Sinai over the past years, months, weeks, is what we have received at Sinai, beloved, a transformative infusion of redemption, restoration, of joy, of shalom, of hope, and of love? Or is what we have received through the Torah, through the time spent focusing on the Holy One and His ways, is it just another form of deadly religion? Which one is it? Have we received a transformative infusion of redemption and restoration and joy, shalom, hope, and love, or not? If we have, then we will become those people. We, after we arise back, after we descend and arise again, and descend and arise again, and after we receive and embrace the disciplines the Holy One has given to us, that's what we will become. We will show the world, will we not? that we are a transformative people, that we have been a, received a transformative infusion of redemption and restoration and joy and shalom and hope and love that offers the world a better way than just another religion. Well, the, the hard lessons of the wilderness are coming up. They, they will come at us fast and furious. We will not be prepared for what's about to happen. Three days march when the wilderness will cause us all sorts of grief and we will respond in our first descent and then he will try to get us back on ascent through discipline. I'll remind you of a message from Shaul, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 5 through 13. Here's what Shaul said about this time that we are about to enter into. The stories that we read about in the next few weeks. Now these things became our examples, he said. To the intent, for the purpose, that we should not lust after raw self-interest and self-preservation and self-promotion, as they also lusted, and that we not become idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Nor let us make, build adulteries, ad zanab, sexual... Uh, yeah. Sins. Let us not asazana as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. And let us not uh, tempt Mashiach as some of those were also tempted and were destroyed, bitten by serpents. Nor let us complain as some of us them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. And he goes on later to say, therefore, in the same passage, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Beloved, don't be proud of your knowledge. Don't think you know everything. Don't think you can handle anything coming your way because without the presence and the leadership and the guidance and the discipline of the Holy One, you will not. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. But here's the good news. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to all men. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able. But with the temptation will always give a means of escape. Okay, so let's begin with the preparations. I'll go back now to what we read, that passage that we read about when you arise to tend the lamps, when the, ten, the seven lights. Now, this is uh, what I call evening and morning lamp recalibrating protocols. That's kind of long, so I'll say it again. We all are given, like Aharon, evening and morning lamp recalibrating protocols. We need to be doing something evening and morning before we go to bed and when we arise. We need to be focusing these times of day on recalibrating and re. Uh, adjusting the lamps so we become the light of the world that he called us to be. Now the thing about this service is it is what I call His Majesty's secret service and His Majesty being the creator of the universe in this case our King. 
His Majesty's Secret Service. Why do I call it his Secret Service? Because no one's watching, no one knows, no one sees but him. This thing that we do is internal and it is the first thing we do in the morning and the last thing we do at night when hopefully nobody's sitting there watching us. We're not doing it for an audience. We're not doing it for applause. We're not doing it for uh, support. This is what we do because we are who we are, because he is who he is. We calibrate the lamps. We make sure that what we're shining is pure light, reflecting his pure light, not generating something of our own. We clean out the bowls, all the things that have accumulated, the, 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 the junk that has accumulated in our lives, in the evening and again on the morning. We prepare ourselves to be vessels of pure light. All right. The secret hidden disciplines of the light bearers. We are to be light bearers. The message is let there be light and we are those who are supposed to bring light into the world. So we have to accept the yoke of a light bearer or we will not shine pure light. We will have to embrace the disciplines of light bearing or we will not bear pure light. We will have to surrender to the workmanship required to make us shine purely. That is a beatenness. That is a discipline. That is something that takes place to us from the external force that makes us bring forth the purest of light. Excuse me just a second. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. All right. Every morning, alone in the holy place, Aaron, in the beauty realm, the picture we're given that we're supposed to draw this illusion from, this deeper truth from, Aaron was supposed to clean and resupply each of the lamps of the menorah one at a time. He was to do this in order to assure that at least six of the lamps were always burning, six of the seven lamps were always burning, and that the final, uh, re final result was always that the light was pure and reflected the glory of the Holy One. So every evening and every morning, he would ascend the platform next to the menorah. He would ascend, and you're arising. He would ascend the platform next to the menorah, and he would carefully scrub each lamp clean of carbon residue that he had acquired. He'd do those lamp uh, bowls one at a time. He'd replace the bowl if necessary. He'd refill it with oil as appropriate. He'd insert a fresh wick of uh, linen, uh, which was by, by tradition, they say it, it was actually the, the uh, used robes that he'd worn, the linen robes. He would insert a fresh wig and he would kindle the lamp before going on to the next one, one lamp at a time, seven, seven steps in his protocol in order to prepare and make the lamps stands ready. That's the picture you're supposed to be seeing. Now you're supposed to apply that picture. The key is how will you apply that picture in your life? What will you do? First of all, what will you trust the Holy One to be doing? Yeshua used the same picture in the book of Revelation when he was discussing with John. And what John saw, Yohanan saw, the revelator saw, was Yohan, Yeshua was, was moving in amongst the seven candlesticks and the seven candles and the seven lamps. And he was attending them. And this is the picture he saw. So we see the picture in Aaron. We see the picture in Messiah, now we see the picture in us. What are we doing? How are we cooperating with the Holy One's plan to keep the light pure, to keep the lamp burning, to keep the residue of the stench of carbon deposits from blocking things? The first thing we had to do is make sure that Aaron had to do was to make sure that the light always focused and, and shone, shone forward. Forward toward the Holy One, not toward us. But we're supposed, not supposed to light our own way. We're supposed to light the path that the Holy One is falling in. We're supposed to turn all the attention and the focus, the spotlight upon the Holy One. And toward, in Aaron's case, in the place of the, of the Holy Place, the focus was on the curtain, the veil that led into the Holy of Holies into the place where the Aaron, the, 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 the ark was uh, situated with the mercy seat and the very manifest pulsing presence of the Kedusha energy the Holy One was resident. Now, so we focus the attention on the Holy One. So every evening, every morning, we need to stop what we're doing, stop the worry about what's going on in the news, 
although that's not irrelevant, it is not that what we need to do at that time. We need to focus our attention on the Holy One and stay. We have to absorb His light before we can reflect His light. So we got to get focused upon Him. Second thing that Aaron had to do it was to maintain the purity of the source, of the vessels. He had to cleanse and purify and scrape and clean and do what needed to be to make sure that the vessel itself was clean. How are we doing on that? How are you doing on you being the vessel, your mouth being the vessel, your mind being the vessel, your hands being the vessel, your heart being the vessel? How are you? Are you a clean vessel? Or has your vessel become polluted by contamination? Have the atmospheric conditions uh, brought in carbon residue of flesh and pseudo-intellect into your vessel that make it an impure vessel. Now let's start every evening, every morning, as you're in, in your arising, let's go and have a protocol. Develop it with the Holy One. Let the Holy One teach you the seven-step protocol as to how to bring forth pure life. And the final factor that the Aaron had to do is stick to the blueprint. Follow the pattern and let the Holy One be the, the one who is, is in charge of the direction and in the flow and the intensity of the light and the impact the light has in the world. All right, I want to move on. I do want you to uh, go to the second phase here. After the morning lamp recalibrating protocols of 8, 1 through 4, the next thing we have is a commissioning of the Levites or Leviim, which is in Hebrew. Uh, to their life of Avodah, uh, chapter 8, verses 5 through 26. This, this is all part of the preparation for getting ready for the proving ground. The Holy One's going to give us another picture, another imagery. The Leviim are supposed to be evidences. Out, the, the, the priests and Aaron and what we're doing in the secret place, the, the secret service things of the lamp are one thing. But to actually how we behave in front of other people as servants. Now the Levim were to be doorkeepers and floor sweepers, as I like to call them. They were menial tasks, but they were seen by people. And they had to maintain the fact they were, they were not doing this for show. They were doing this for service. Or what we do, is what we do for show? Is it to make ourselves feel better? Or is it to make ourselves feel spiritual? Or is it to actually physically serve somebody? and do something to help someone, that's the key. Well, the Levim are our model. The picture of the, of the actual verses talk about their ordination and their substitution for the uh, firstborn of Israel, about their dedication to Aharon and service of him and his sons, about the hard work they're going to do, but it, they're basically being commissioned as doorkeepers and floor sweepers. And people who will do the menial task without asking for thanks, without asking for appreciation or recognition or title or position in the in the body. This are we humble servants? This is the E. And so the key, the second idea of preparing ourselves for the desert proving ground is whether we are willing to take the example of the Leviim to become doorkeepers and floor sweepers, humble servants who do not demand recognition but know they are seen and understand they have responsibility for those who see them as well. Okay, the, the model of the Leviim is to take the Leviim from among B'nai Israel and to hire them, make them clean, make them pure. Sprinkle mechata'at, the, the, the waters the, of, the, of the burnt offering on them, or on the sin offering on them, and let them then shave their bodies and wash their clothes and make themselves to whore. Are you you understand this is an imagery that we're being presented. This is beauty realm imagery that we're being given that has a deeper spiritual meaning to each one of us. Each one of us is called to, to cleanse off, clear off the things that make us a showpiece, make us something besides menial servants and lovers of people that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to make ourselves to whore. Are you making yourself to whore every day? It says, bring the Levine before the Holy One. And have B'nai Israel lay their hands on the Leviim. Are we supportive of those who do this, who don't put on a show, but who actually do the service? And have Aharon present the Leviim before the Holy One like a wave presentation from B'nai Israel. Service should be humble service, menial service as necessary to help other people. This and to bring forth the kingdom. This is what we're called to do. 
So I'm going to move on to the third, the third challenge, the third preparation for the proving ground is that we're going to observe Passover. The first Passover we've ever experienced as free men. The first Passover we did was back in Egypt and we were slaves. This is our first Passover as free men. We get the choice as to whether we're going to do this or not. And the Holy One says, yes, do Passover. Even though you're not yet in the land, wherever you are, even though you're not living in Jerusalem and the Messianic kingdom has not come, even though none of the things that you're hopeful and believe is part of your destiny have occurred, still it is critical that you do remember and remake the Passover. And so the first Passover is free men. Now this is going to turn out to be the last Passover we celebrate for a generation. There are reasons for that. We'll get to, to it later, but we won't celebrate Passover again until we come into the land um, generation later. Uh, but the instructions regarding Passover are found at chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Now here's the deal. The story of the good tidings of our redemption, the basar, la basar, the good news of joy and, re and, re and rejoicing must be told to our children. This is identity mission critical. If we do not tell the good news, to our, they're going to think this is just a religion. They're going to think what we do is just a bunch of learning that people do in study halls somewhere, but it doesn't apply to real life. It doesn't apply in ways that inspire and encourage the younger generations, the new generations that are coming after us. When we quit telling the good stories of what took place and what has happened, and that's what the Passover is all about. Teach your children. When they ask you, what is this? You will tell them. And that is the story of the good tidings. How are you doing on your good tidings story? What do you talk about with your children? What do you talk about with your friends? What do you talk about in your conversations around the coffee table? What do you talk about at, around meals? What are your conversations? Because you said the first conversation, the first rule of conversation in the kingdom is we're talking about the good news of redemption. It doesn't mean we're given uh, some sort of a, a, a magic potion message. It's telling good stories. It's telling the, 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 the testimonies of what God has done for us and laughing and rejoicing and singing in his name. So that's the third protocol, the third preparation. And the fourth one is what I call developing follow the leader orientation. Before we head off into the wilderness, before we go off into the testing ground, the proving ground of the midbar, before we do that, the issue is going to be Will we follow the Holy One or will we follow ourselves and our attitudes and our opinions and our ap appetites? <clears throat> will we follow men? Will we follow complainers? Will we follow uh, uh, blame throwers? Will we follow class envy baiters? Will we follow people like Korok? Will we follow people like, like the ten spies? Will we follow negative naysayers? We follow doomsday announcers. What will we do? Who are we following? Who do we belong to? This is follow the leader orientation. And of course, the, the leader, the Holy One, is leading us through his pillar of fire and cloud. That's the message. That's the Peshat. That's the, the surface level. But he's saying, do you understand, even if there's no physical cloud that you can look at, to know that you know is my presence, that you know I'm with you and I'm being the leader of the camp, Moshe is not your leader, the aliens were to land on earth, and, and ask you, take me to your leader. Would you take me to, take them to Moshe? Or would you take them to me, he would say. Because you see, I am the leader. Follow the leader orientation. Now, uh, this issue of, of leadership is it's real because if we don't believe he's with us, we're gonna follow men. We're gonna follow their doctrines. We're gonna follow their, their teachings. We're gonna follow their ministries. We're going to, or we're going to follow their, their, their political uh, and their ideological uh, bullet points. We're going to follow their actions and their fights, their wars. We're going to get engaged in those things. But if we follow the Holy One, no, we will stay above that fray. We will bring life into the people that are caught up in that fray. So that's the next thing. Cloud, I call it cloud awareness. I've looked at clouds from both sides now. The cloud, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, it comes and it says, whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, then B'nai Israel would take up their journey. And in the place where the cloud settled, there B'nai Israel would pitch their tents. And this was at the command, at the direction of the mouth of the Holy One. They either remained encamped or they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Holy One 
at the mouth of the Holy One by the hand of Moshe. Do you see who is the leader of this camp? Who's your leader? Is it some rabbi, pastor, teacher? Is it some uh, politician? Is it some ideological uh, spokesperson? Is it some talking head on the media? Who is your leader? It really it does matter. The Holy One is the only one who is qualified to lead you. Others just lead you by hand. He leads you by his presence and by his instruction and by his mouth, his words. The final, uh, the next, the fifth of, of, the, of the preparations before we actually leave is uh, communication protocol. Every covenant people, every people, every, every group, every individual needs to be in touch in communication protocols. And so he's going to give us the tr silver trumpets, the, the silver trumpets, and learn to tune our ears, teach us to tune our ears to the trumpet blast. And listen for what the trumpet is saying, not just the fact that it is a trumpet blast. Listen to what the message of the trumpet blast may be. Learn how to interpret those messages from the Holy One, from heaven. And that is giving being expounded through the blowing of the high priest and or his sons in this situation. Learning communication protocol. Do you have a communication protocol with the Holy One? Are you listening to heaven? Are you hearing the instructions from heaven? Or are you too tuned in to the television and the news and too tuned in to the political parties and too tuned in to the government officials and too tuned in to the church and the synagogue leaders? Too, are you, who are you tuned to? And are you ready? Are your ear leaning inclined toward the trumpet and to the sound of the holy ones? And do you know how to interpret it when you get it? All right. I want to move directly into the harder time. I want to go on the deep, deep dive for the last few minutes we have. The first challenge of the desert proving ground. After we leave, and I'll just kind of skip right over that and let you commend, I'll commend it to your reading about how we left at verses 10, began to believe verse 21, uh, chapter 10, verse 21. Now we're going to go into chapter 11. And chapter 11 is shocking because three days into the wilderness, Three days into the desert of Paran, after we leave the desert of Sinai, we go from the we go from the the wilderness, uh, the watershed of the thorn bushes, to the watershed of deep caverns, caves of of negativity, of pride, of pre presumption, and that's where we're going to be, and we're going to feel the presence, the pressure of that. The beginning with verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, and the people complain. Now, this is where we're going to do our deep dive because this is the key, the secret to descent. If you want to, if you want to experience a descent, start complaining or start hanging around people who are complaining, who have negativity coming out of their mouth. Instead of shalom, instead of this joy and the good news that we're supposed to be, that we're commissioned, that we're uh, designed to carry, and the light that we're supposed to carry, the people and the people complained. Ha! And so they, they complained. Here's what they complained. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. It was just there and given to us, right? We misremembered, didn't we? We remember the fish which we were, ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks. I can see their mouth watering. They're talking about stuff that they want. And they're causing, the, stirring up an appetite. It says, and actually in Hebrew, it says they, they generated a craving. Well, we remember the fish that we ate in freely in Egypt, with the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, oh, the onions and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. They said, there's nothing at all for us except this manna before our eyes. <laughs> That's one way to think about a miracle from the Holy One, that just this manna. The one thing to think about the provision of God for you, or you can just think of it as, oh, it's just this manna. Well, uh, we have this complaining, we have this sense of craving, this, uh, we have this negativity of the flesh and then the pseudo intellect that flies, and then we have egos, and then we have self-interest. It's all raw, which in English is usually translated as evil, but doesn't have any moral implications. Well, it may have some moral implications, but that's not the focus. The focus of it is not morality. The focus of it is self. It is the, the opposite of following the leadership of the Holy One and doing His work humbly and His will and shining a pure light 
And the focus instead is upon what do I want and what do I like and how does it affect me and how do I feel about it and what does it make emotions does it inspire or encourage? What uh, attitudes does it bring forth? That, those are the things that Ra is all about. Same thing that happened in the, in the, in the uh, garden when the, they started thinking about Ra. Well, so Moshe said to the Holy One, <laughs> why, why? Or he said, why did you do this to me? Let me just die, kill me right now. It's just so horrible, the burden. Now we see how the negativity spreads. It's a contagious disease. Once you start with a kernel of complaint, there is no kingdom purpose for complaining. It does not serve any kingdom purpose. Complaining, griping, finding the negative, seeking to find fault, seeking to, to lay blame, seeking to, to portray yourself as a victim, an offended person. That, I know it seems, the psychologists of this world, the psychiatrists of the world, they make money off of this process, they give you pills, they do whatever to keep you in this depressed state. Thinking that how horrible life is to you and how terrible it is that you have to live in such a time as this. But here's the deal. The kingdom says, oh no, we're key people of joy. We're people of hope. And it is not something that just happens because we just born this way. We cultivate it in the secret service of the morning. We cultivate it in the tending of the lamp and the recalibrating of the pure light. We cultivate it in our, the way in which we listen to what we listen to, the sound of the trumpet and the voices of heaven, not to the voices of men complaining and, and the, the, the ideologues and the, and the demagogues of this world who are trying to divide and, and blame everybody else for their problems. This is our time to deep dive. So what is complaining mean? In Hebrew, the phrase, the verb used is anan, anan, uh, aleph, uh, nun, nun sofit. And it is the exact antithesis. It's almost like a parallel to aman, which is aleph mem nun sofit, which we translate as trust, belief, faith. It, what really means, though, it is drawing the nurture and giving nurture to a life force. Aman is like a pregnant woman uh, who is now nurturing her, her body begins to, to develop and focus on nurturing this new life force within her. And then after it's born, it puts it to her breast and she nurtures it that way. And as it's growing, she nurtures it with food. This is the idea of amaning, learning to do this. Well, ananing is to do the opposite, is to abort, abort, abort. <laughs> as to, is to complain, is to say, that I don't want to be pregnant. I don't want to have a life force. I mean, I, my life force is what I want. And uh, this other life force is Crimping my style here. I don't want to be pregnant anymore. I don't want to have a baby anymore. I don't want to have the Messiah birthed in me, being responsible for bringing this and presenting it to the world in proper timing. I don't want that. This is Anon. So when the people were complainers, they complained. They aborted the mission. They aborted the whole plan of the Holy One. And when they did this, it says, the Haya Ha'am Kimit Honim, the people were as complainers. And Ra, Ba'azne, Adonai. And it was toxic self centeredness, self promotion in the Holy One's ears. Well, Anon means to demonstrate sadness, sorrow, or other unhappy state. Now you see the contrast between what we're called to do. Why complaining doesn't fit with us, with what we do. Because, you see, it demonstrates that we're sad, we're sorrowful, we're de depressed, we're unhappy, we're discontent. And it comes with a discount, downcast countenance. It comes with a negative energy, uh, a verbalization of that. It comes with mourning and grumbling and expressing dissatisfaction, expressing discontent, uh, whining, finding faults, laying blame, criticizing, protesting. Uh, lodging accusations of unfairness and wrongdoing and just accusations in general, falsely labeling or, or ne negatively, destructively labeling other people, dehumanizing them as, and putting them into groups, lumping them into groups as opposed to dealing with them on an individual basis, trying to find the potential in them. You see what complaining does. There is no, no redemptive benefit whatsoever to it. This is one of the things we have to learn. First thing in the desert, learn to avoid, to fight off this desire to complain because we were made for something else. And every time we complain, we lie 
to the world about who we are and why we're here. And we, no wonder they are confused. No wonder they do not understand our message because we have not been a pure tone. We have not been pure light. We have not told them the stories, the good stories, the good news. La Basar, Mabasar, the good stories of joy and hope and peace. Well, beloved, that is all we have the time for this morning to talk about with Parsha Beha Alotka. Thank you for joining in. I pray that you have been blessed and pray that you will be encouraged and inspired. I also would ask that you would, if you've been listening, that you just drop a note, let us know who you are, where you're listening from or watching from, and any comments, questions uh, that you may wish to have, or prayer requests if you have those. Shabbat Shalom.